This morning's Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. When Jesus heard the news about John, he left there in a boat and went to a lonely place by himself. The people heard about it, and so they left their towns and followed him by land. Jesus got out of the boat, and when he saw the large crowd, his heart was filled with pity for them, and he healed their sick. That evening his disciples came to him and said, It is already very late, and this is a lonely place. Send the people away and let them go to the villages to buy food for themselves. They don't have to leave, answered Jesus. You yourselves give them something to eat. Well, all we have here are five loaves and two fish, they replied. Then bring them here to me, Jesus said. He ordered the people to sit down on the grass. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up to heaven, and gave thanks to God. He broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. Everyone ate and had enough. Then the disciples took up twelve baskets full of whatever was left over. The number of men who ate was about 5,000, not counting the women and children. Earlier this summer, the Southern Baptist Convention, the national body of actually the largest Protestant denomination on the continent, made a very controversial decision. The Southern Baptists voted to expel two of their congregations, one of them being the largest in the entire denomination, Saddleback Church. And amazingly, they did not do this uh, because of this sexual abuse scandal that has rocked the denomination over the last few years. No. No, these congregations that were exiled were exiled for permitting something that was apparently much, much worse. They were expelled because they had chosen to have women on staff as pastors. Now, I would note that actually having women pastors is not something that's particularly new for such churches. Many Baptist congregations have had women as pastors for a very long time. In fact, one of the expelled churches, Fern Creek Baptist Church of Louisville, Kentucky, has had their senior minister, Linda Barnes Popham, Popham, for three decades, three decades before they eventually kicked out the congregation. This decision was actually part of a reactionary crackdown within the denomination, a retrenchment of sorts, as the church reacts to what is actually a time of crisis. The Southern Baptist Church is indeed the largest denomination in North America, but it is also the one that is declining the fastest. I mean, lots of denominations are in decline, including our own, of course. And I do not rejoice or crow over any such decline. But the decline that the SBC, Southern Baptist Church, is facing is stunning. The Presbyterian Church in Canada is getting smaller, sure. But the SBC loses more members than are in the entire PCC every few months. And so what's happened is that a reactionary conservative group has seized power in the denomination with the intent of taking the church back to what they see as a time before the decline began, a time when you might say women, or they might say women, knew their place, and it wasn't in leadership. But this is not a new idea. It's an old idea. (coughs) And it's an idea that's been with the church for a very long time. It's the idea that certain sorts of people just don't count. Not when you want to build a church. I've long wondered about the end of the story of the feeding of the 5,000s in the gospel. 
The story is told in all of the New Testament Gospels, but at the ends of Matthew and Mark's account, there is a count of the number of people who ate. And this counting is obviously important, right? It's a way of making it clear that a miracle, an incredible miracle, has occurred. This, then, is how the story ends in the Gospel of Mark. The number of men... <coughs> The number of men who were fed was 5,000. But Matthew ends by noting an explicit detail that you see nowhere else. Matthew ends it like this. The number of men who ate was about 5,000, not counting the women and children. And so let me ask you, why not count the women and children? I mean, if, if the point of this story is to show this incredible wonder that Jesus has performed, why exclude so many people from your accounting? Any politician or organizer or preacher I've ever heard of has tended not to overstate, but to, uh, to overstate, not understate, the size of a crowd, right? Donald Trump is kind of famous for it. And every time the media ever tried to correct the record with a more realistic estimate, he would attack them relentlessly. And yet we're told that this gospel writer did not even bother counting a substantial part of the crowd. How many people didn't he count? Well, Various interpreters have come up with certain theories about how many people would have been in the crowd if there were 5,000 adult males. <coughs> Not everyone agrees, but commentators who made a study of the demographics of early first century Galilee estimate that a crowd might have been as large as 15, maybe 20,000 people. So if you knew the crowd was that big, why would you not bother to count three quarters of them? But that's apparently what happens here. And it goes back to the issue that I started with. This idea, older and far than a recent meeting of the Southern Baptist Church, this idea built somewhere into the foundations of churches themselves that certain people don't count, or at least they don't count the same the notion that women don't count has deep roots. <coughs> and I feel I need to say that I don't believe that this idea comes from Jesus or from God or even from the fruit, true nature of the church. Where Jesus' concerns lie are, is made very clear at the beginning of this story. Jesus has just been through a kind of a rough time. He just learned that John the Baptist, who to a certain extent, seems to have been a kind of mentor to him, has been murdered by King Herod. Of course, Jesus takes this hard. And Jesus, Christian doctrine teaches us, was utterly human, no matter what else he was. So, of course, he feels this deeply. And so Jesus needs a little bit of self-care, right? And so he heads off to a deserted place in a boat hoping for a bit of time to reflect and meditate and pray. But his self-care is interrupted by the needs of a great mass of people who come out looking for him, even though they have to, to walk a great distance in order to find him. And as much as he might need the time alone, as much as he is aware of his own needs, Jesus recognizes <coughs> that there's a need to care for all of these people. And so we're told that when he saw them, he had compassion for them, and he cured their sick. And when he heals them, he goes on, and he goes on to feed them. He does not fail to count all of them, obviously. He does not simply provide only for the most important, the most powerful. He doesn't feed or heal only the men. Obviously, for Jesus, the women and the children count as do their needs. So if it didn't start with Jesus, where did this come from? Well, by the time this gospel was written, why by the time this gospel was written, 
and people stopped counting women and children. Well, it has everything to do with the society and the culture in which the early church found itself. Now, there's lots of evidence that shows that the early church did count women, counted them among their leadership. There are women named as apostles and leaders of churches. It's why Paul can say things like, there is no longer male and female for all of you are one in Christ. But the early church found itself in a culture dominated by the Roman Empire that was extremely patriarchal. And such a culture found the very idea of counting women, of giving women significance to be offensive. And by the time that Matthew had written his gospel, by the time of some of the later letters of the New Testament, that attitude had begun to drift into the church as well. And the church began to feel as if it needed to go along with society in order to get along. And this attitude continued, has continued to affect churches for centuries. (coughs) Excuse me, for centuries. And we see that. We see that in recent decisions of the Southern Baptist Church, among others. The issue hasn't gone away. It does mean a lot to me to be part of a church and part of a denomination that has done some serious work on counting women on recognizing and and appreciating the contribution that they have made to the church over many decades, over recent decades. And I appreciate the steps we've taken to count others who have been excluded from our accounting for far too long. But do not think for a moment that we can lean up, lean back, put up our feet, and assume, therefore, that the job is done. We will always encounter a cultural tendency not to count certain kinds of people. And so long as we do that, we will be missing the true picture of God and what God is doing among us. For example, for a long time, the impact of a church such as ours was measured by one metric, one metric alone. The number of people sitting in pews at one particular hour on Sunday mornings. Congregations that had lots of people sitting in the right place at the right time each week were considered to be successful, were considered to be having a real impact. Even then, that was not really an accurate measure of the liveliness of a church because lots of the people who were vital to the church were not counted by that metric. People who were teaching Sunday school, for example, or people who had good reasons for why they couldn't be there at that particular time, but were indeed great supporters of the church in other significant ways. (coughs) So it was never quite accurate. But these old assumptions have become more problematic because of recent developments. Now we have people who attend worship online, on Zoom or on Facebook Live. We have others who watch videos of sermons and other elements of the worship at another time from that special hour that was once the only hour that mattered. Some do so from great distances around the globe. Do those people count? Are they a part of the life and work of the church? Of course they are. But we often do not count them. Even more, there are all kinds of people for in this community, for whom this church is part of their spiritual life, for whom this congregation (coughs) helps to meet both their spiritual and their physical needs. And yet they have never been there at that magic hour on Sunday morning. Maybe they never will be. I'm talking, for one thing, about people who come in for a good meal, to pick up food from the food bank or community cupboard, I'm talking about people who need help with clothing for their families. This church is their church too in that it meets those kinds of needs. The fact that they are welcomed warmly and treated without judgment, that feeds their souls as well as their hungry stomachs. And if they were asked what they know of the church, they would speak well of St. Outer's Hesper. St. Andrew's Hespler. Do we count them? We do not. 
I'm also talking about an army of volunteers that keeps our ministries operating. Many of those people do not worship here. But they have also formed a society of mutual support and encouragement. And isn't that what the church is supposed to be about? Recently, for example, one of our Hope Clothing volunteers suffered the death of a spouse. And she found the support that she received from her fellow volunteers at Hope Clothing to be invaluable. I was talking to people at the food bank recently, and they were noting that we generally severely undervalue the contribution of our volunteers. If we were to put a a dollar value, and they are working on models to put a dollar value on these things, if we were to put a dollar value on our volunteers, it works out that this church makes an additional contribution of thousands of dollars to this community. This is the mission of the church. So these are all people living out the mission of the church, doing so admirably. Are you going to tell me that they don't count because they never sat in a pew? It's ridiculous. Yet that's what we seem to assume all all the time. That's just how things are, right? The church sadly, has a history of not counting certain people. For centuries, women didn't count, even though they often did the greatest part of the work. For centuries, members of certain minority, racial, ethnic, or language groups didn't count. No, we were... (coughs) (coughs) We were happy not to include them in our statistics when they made us look good, But we didn't really believe they contributed anything of value. Their theological reflections, for example, were often dismissed. I'm glad to say that the church today has learned better about such things. But still, still we fell into the temptation of not counting certain people. We say that we love and welcome families with children. We have a hard time making space for those families when they don't fit the, family, the pattern of families we're used to. Imagine those people who went out to Jesus when he wanted, just wanted to be alone after he heard about the death of John. They are a picture of the whole church. They gathered as we gather for one reason, one reason alone, because the compassion of Jesus met them where they were. Each one was met according to their need. Each was given a role in ministry according to his or her ability. They all counted. That's why we always have to be careful about who we don't count. Lord God, help us to remember always who counts and why. Amen.